Good afternoon. I'm Steve Lankenau. Welcome to this webinar entitled The Impact of COVID-19 on People Who Use Drugs and Harm Reduction Efforts in Philadelphia. This is part of a webinar series sponsored by the Dornsife School of Public Health at Drexel University called Emerging Issues in the Coronavirus Pandemic. Uh, let's have our panel introduce themselves. Uh, Clayton, you want to begin? Sorry, working with the mute button. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being on this webinar. My name is Clayton Ruley. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Volunteer Services at Prevention Point Philadelphia. Uh, I've been at Prevention Point Philadelphia starting as an intern in 2008 and full-time since 2010. Seen a lot of changes come. I think you, can everyone hear Clayton? I can now, I froze. I think okay. I froze. Okay, you cut out for a minute there, Clayton. Thanks for the intro. Carol, do you wanna introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, I'm Carol Rostischer, I'm president and founder of Angels in Motion. We do outreach, harm reduction, um, mobile syringe exchange across the city of Philadelphia. Ben. Uh, hi there, I'm uh, Ben Cochiaro. I'm a, a family doc by training, but I uh, work uh, on the mobile addiction medicine program for Prevention Point Philadelphia. I also lecture in pathophysiology to the University of Southern California nurse practitioner program. And uh, uh, I suppose I'm an adjunct fellow with the University of Pennsylvania Center for Public Health Initiatives. But I should mention that uh, the opinions I express today do not necessarily reflect the opinions of any of my various employers. Uh, we're going to have another panelist join us momentarily, Chris Moraff. Um, we'll have him introduce himself once he joins the webinar. And then again, I'm Steve Lankenau. I'm a professor and the Associate Dean of Research at the Dornsife School. I've been conducting research with people who use drugs over the past 20 years in cities such as Los Angeles, New York, and Philadelphia. Here in Philadelphia, I've been co-leading two studies in Kensington, one focused on testing an overdose prevention app called Unity Philly, in a second one preparing for the eventual opening of an overdose prevention site. So the way we're gonna run this webinar is uh, we've developed a series of questions focused on COVID-19, people who use drugs and harm reduction that will be presented to the panel. Each question will be addressed by typically two panelists. Once we run through the questions or reach 245, we'll open up the discussion to the audience. You can uh, post questions through the chat function and we'll, we'll aggregate those and then uh, get to them at the end of the discussion. Um, before we start, I'll be presenting some background information statistics to help frame the discussion. So let's begin with the idea of people who use drugs. So we're talking about individuals who use psychoactive substances non-medically or without a prescription. Now they may use these drugs to self-medicate for a variety of physical or psychological health conditions such as pain, PTSD, or anxiety. Particularly a focus of this webinar will be people who use drugs who may rely on the illicit street economy for the drug supply, rely on social services and community-based harm reduction assistance, are at increased risk for violence, overdose, HIV or hepatitis, and are often marginally housed and food insecure. And just as further background information, the overdose deaths in Philadelphia in 2019 were approximately 950 due to opioids and 1,100 overall. It's fairly flat compared to the rates in 2018. Uh, harm reduction, just briefly, is a set of practical strategies and ideas focused to reduce the consequences associated with drug use, whether it's overdose, HIV, or violence. It incorporates a range of strategies from safer use to managed use to abstinence to meet people where they are. Uh, strategies in harm reduction may include medication-assisted treatment, such as methadone, buprenorphine, as well as syringe exchange and naloxone distribution programs. Now, these programs are often performed by community-based organizations or workers who engage in street outreach and who have close contact with people who use drugs. So that's why COVID-19, <clears throat> excuse me, provides unique challenges to deliver harm reduction services to people who use drugs while also maintaining the safety of workers and the people who use drugs. 
And lastly, just some kind of um, statistics on COVID-19. So currently we're at uh, around over 3 million cases worldwide, over 200,000 deaths here in the United States. While testing is still um, under, underperforming, we have over you know, about 5.6 million tests, close to a million cases, and over uh, 56,000 deaths. In Pennsylvania, the situation is around 42,000 cases, 1,600 deaths. And you can see that, Phil, that, that Philadelphia leads the, uh, not surprisingly, the largest county, the most cases, the most deaths. And we also have just a little brief visual on where the, the, the cases are most um, pronounced. And before we get into the questions, I thought I came across this article by uh, Robert Rice, former uh, Labor Secretary and Economist, who believes kind of posit this emerging class structure that COVID-19 is producing. So we kind of have four classes, a group called, he calls the remotes, who are the professional managerial and technical workers, largely you know, working from home, paid, and could comprise about 35% of the workforce, followed by the um, essentials. These are healthcare workers, first responders, food processors, harm reduction workers, and about another 30% of the workers who are out there on the front lines dealing with the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. We have the uh, unpaid, which is folks who uh, recently lost their jobs or had previously been unemployed. And this, these folks could, could reach up to 25% of the, of the population, while over 9 million have lost their health insurance. And then lastly, we have a group that could be called forgotten, for whom social distancing is, is very difficult based on communal living situations prisoners, homeless persons, nursing house residents. And this is probably where a lot of the, the people who use drugs fall into this category. So let's move on to the, uh, to the, to the questions here. Um, so this first question, um, social distancing has been a key to flattening the curve of new COVID-19 cases in Philadelphia and elsewhere. Um, how would, um, this is for uh, Ben and Clayton, how are outreach workers being instructed to practice social distancing when the community are offering harm reduction services? So, um, you know, I think that it's important to think about what prevention point looked like before the epidemic. Um, you know, we're an organization that prides ourselves on both dignity and affirming care and a focus on what's called a low demand model. And uh, sort of as a way to give you an idea of what that means, we have a drop-in center uh, that was sort of the prime example of this. We had couches, a television, an urn full of coffee and plenty of sugar, and access to services when slash if the person who was in the drop-in was interested. If not, they could enjoy the coffee and a few minutes out of the rain. Um, now that we're dealing with a epidemic of a virus that is spread through airborne and respiratory droplets, we've had to make a number of really big changes to our programs uh, in order to protect uh, our, our clientele and our workers and to, uh, to flatten that curve. Uh, so perhaps uh, Clayton could give some more specifics, but I, you know, I think that it's really a, a challenging thing to both protect and affirm the dignity of the folks you're working for while at the same time protecting them from uh, you know, an infectious uh, uh, disease that's, uh, that's reached epidemic proportions in our city. Clayton, you want to comment? You're on mute. Clayton, can you hear us? I think we're having a little trouble with Clayton. Mm -hmm. Carol, well, do you wanna you, you wanna, wanna um, chime in a bit, Steve? Yeah, so we Clayton have this. get back. Yeah, we're we're out on the streets and we're always trying to apply the six feet distancing and explain to our participants why. And in the beginning, like, you know, they don't have access to social media, the news, anything. So we were explaining a lot to them and a lot of them are getting it now, right? It, it's hard for them because social distancing themselves, is, it's hard. They're out there, they're on the streets, right? But now they're getting it and they're worried about us being out there. Like when I go up, you know, everybody stands back. Waiting. 
like six feet distance, six feet distance. And like general reminders like that from each of them is really working. Just, just the reminder of the, the distance of six feet. Helpful. Mm -hmm. Clayton, can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can people hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very okay. Good. I'm in the basement, and so, uh, you know, the internet doesn't always work well, so I had to go to the phone. <laughs> Seems like it's working better. Um, yes, I mean, I would agree with Ben and uh, Carol. It's definitely been a challenge uh, as a staff. Um, we definitely love our participants, and whether it's a hug or a high five, it's been a challenge to explain to folks due to a lack of, uh, you know, cognizance given um, lack of technology, you know, news source uh, information regularly, um, you know, that we're doing this not uh, because we're scared of them, but we are, uh, you know, practicing distancing for them and also for ourselves and, um, you know, people that we are living with and loving outside of our, our work sphere. Um, it has definitely been um, around like basically building infrastructure like around our building and around our services to do shorter interactions with the individuals that we work with. Um, that can include signage, it can include uh, putting dots on the ground um, uh, and also having you know uh, extra staff and volunteers help us space people out as well as giving just general uh, you know knowledge about uh, COVID-19 coronavirus um, so folks understand uh, the bigger picture of what's going on. Um, but certainly it's been a challenge trying to implement and it's been really hard for staff because staff wants to reach out to each other, reach out to the people that we work with on a regular basis and let them know that everything's going to be okay. Uh, and they you know, have to also come to a revelation, realization that um, by doing that, they're actually doing more harm than good at this time. Kind of moving on, um, crucial personal protective equipment such as gloves, masks, goggles have been in short supply in Philadelphia and across the country. What's the quality and availability of personal protective equipment to outreach workers? Um, ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So um, limited initially, but improving is, is the big picture. Um, early on in the epidemic, we received assurances from uh, state and federal emergency management uh, groups that uh, PPE would be provided to us as essential workers, um, but that promise was never delivered on, uh, so now we're duking it out with everybody else in the marketplace. Um, you know, the supply chain for personal protective equipment in this country was designed for profit and not contingency, so we're dealing with that fallout, working with limited evidence on workflows to safely reuse and clean the PPE that we have. Um, not to say that this is all bad. We've had a generous outpouring of support from the community and have received numerous donations, both of professional quality and hand-sewn uh, PPE. Um, and I, I was just on a call this morning that uh, sounds like we secured uh, several thousand uh, masks and, and uh, we have gloves and aprons now. So, you know, April 28th, uh, two months into the epidemic, we're, we're finding ourselves covered. How about a uh, prevention point, Clayton? Uh, yes, I would uh, agree with Ben. Uh, initially, we definitely were not prepared in the supply chains that we initially um, had, you know, for some of our other services were able to help, but it wasn't enough compared to uh, what is actually needed. Um, then we certainly got bumped down on the food chain as, um, Obviously, uh, people working in healthcare facilities um, got more of the state and the federal supplies first. Um, we are doing a lot better as far as getting supplies. I do want to reinforce profusely the amount of um, community uh, volunteers um, who are donating their, their time at home um, or in remote off-site locations, uh, you know, coming together to make those um, you know, hand-sewn masks and also donating whatever supplies of medical grade uh, masks and gloves and um, other needed items uh, that we have. Um, but it certainly uh, leaves a void that still, um, while getting better, has not been uh, accomplished. Um, uh, we're just getting to the point where we can re regularly interchange 
um, the PPE that we have uh, with some fluidity uh, and do that knowing that there is a backup plan coming. Um, and if you can imagine what that is on the frontline staffers, then you also know that that means that when we're working with participants um, who also need PPE, uh, you know, we're working to, you know, make sure that we're getting them the best we have, knowing that there's a limit on what we have uh, for staff as well. So it's a challenge. Even in the, uh, the pre-COVID period, gaining access to necessities such as food, shelter, and clean water has been a challenge for people who use drugs. Access to clean water for hand washing is now essential for basic preventive measures. How are food, shelter, and water for hand washing being provided? Um, maybe Ben and Carol could, could give us some thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, food's sort of the easiest thing. Um, the city has uh, initiated its step up to the plate program where it contracts with caterers and restaurants to deliver something like 3,600 meals daily. Um, there are similar programs being developed across the state uh, to deliver hundreds of thousands of meals daily to those in need. Um, in addition, the Philadelphia School Lunch Food uh, Program has been operating on its summer schedule such that uh, school students are able to pick up uh, five days of food uh, on a weekly basis. And this, of course, is in addition to many other mutual aid groups, such as Neighbors Helping Neighbors, working to address the hunger on the individual basis. Um, but of course, as unemployment numbers continue to rise, we need to start thinking about how to address this long term and with a, probably an impending greater demand. Um, from a sanitation perspective, you know, in, in, in 1903, so over a century ago, Philadelphia had 15 public bathhouses that served something like 4 million bathers yearly. Uh, four of those bathhouses were in a half mile radius of Kensington and collectively served about half a million people in the, in the, the year 1903. Um, here we find ourselves by comparison, one century later with the city operating two, two stall toilets and uh, one hand washing station in Kensington plus two sinks and a bathroom trailer at City Hall. Um, Broad Street Ministry has installed 15 additional hand washing stations around the city. But um, I mean, if we're behind in 2020 where we were in 1903, then that probably speaks to a, a larger structural problem. Uh, and you know, that's only further demonstrated in terms of shelter. Uh, there are 6,000 plus folks experiencing homelessness in the city. Um, the city recently opened 750 temporary quarantine beds, um, but with unclear guidelines and uh, sometimes Byzantine process for referral, as well as limited food and medical support for those who have been admitted into those programs, especially for those with substance use disorders. Um, add to this the fact that the city continues to conduct sweeps of homeless encampments against the specific advice of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and when challenged on this issue, released a directive claiming that the homeless are not at greater risk of contracting COVID-19 than the general population. I mean, in case you need data to understand the absurdity of that claim, last month, a shelter in Boston was able to test 408 of its participants and over a third of them were found to be positive for COVID-19. So I guess the bottom line is that the city's provisions for the unsheltered were never adequate in the first place. And really, rather than spend the roughly $25 million a, a year it would take to end homelessness in the city and provide permanent supportive housing, the city has accepted widespread homelessness as a structural feature of its social service schema. Carol, how about what have you observed in terms of just um, some of the basic necessities out in the street for people who use drugs? It's hard, right? Uh, basic necessities are needed. They're so needed. Um, it, it's it's challenging to see people and listen to them and listen to their challenges and not be able to give them the resources they need, which the city is pretty good at not providing the resources they need. They provide what they think they need instead of contacting people who are out there on the front lines and getting to learn the facts what people need. How about contacting the people themselves out there and ask them what they need instead of supplying what you think they need. And that just seems to be the downfall of the city. They keep, the same people keep making the same decisions without contacting anybody that knows or without contacting anybody that it involves and look where we're at.
Thanks. Um, our, our fourth uh, panelist, Chris Moraf, just, just joined us. Chris, could you just um, briefly yeah. um, introduce yourself and we'll get to you in a, in a moment with a few questions. Sure, yeah, sorry about that. My, the, the dog ate my homework or, or <laughs> you know, peed on my computer this morning. So I'm getting an old one that doesn't seem to be working too. Well. I'm a journalist uh, and uh, ethnographer, I guess. You know, I've, been, I've been spending the past three years covering the overdose crisis. Um, I was filming a documentary when COVID-19 when COVID hit. Um, so I, I have, I guess, as to what, you know, as to what they need, I mean, they, they need money to get well, primarily. And, um, and there, many of the hustles that people had have dried up. Uh, so, um, the, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and, and, and uh, stress that's, that's uh, manifesting itself in uh, sporadic violence. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really tense to be up there uh, in Kensington right now along the avenue. Um, there's still quite a few people in clusters, uh, you know, from a COVID, from, from coronavirus uh, harm reduction perspective. Um, nobody's really wearing a mask, although I will say that, that some of the bodegas do sell, do have masks available. Um, but the way the, you know, the intimacy of the community, uh, and I don't think that would even really be enough. Um, I don't know any numbers, or I haven't heard any numbers of, of what, the cases are like coming out of there. Um, I've heard from sources we're having cases pop up in some of the um, some of the rehab facilities uh, in the city. But um, yeah, I mean the need, and I would and I would hate to see a repeat of of the encampments when uh, food rotted in the street while people were still desperate for treatment and and the people that didn't want treatment needed money. Um, and that puts a stress on all of us, really, because we're all compassionate people, and I, I have one or two people that I help out, um, but I don't have a family to feed too. So it's 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 uh, hard to be both in the you know in the community there on either side, you know, if you're close to the people in the community, um, you know. So I, I guess that that's been my, my my observation. This happens whenever there's a stressor on a community. Uh, during Operation Sunrise in 1998, uh, 2002, and, uh, you know, under uh, Safe Streets, whenever there's sort of like a stressor from outside placed upon a community that's already marginalized and um, and in in desperate conditions, it leads to uncharacteristic behavior. Um, and and a lot of that has been, you know, I mean, people are getting. Uh, I wrote a story last week for Filter about this very thing and. And one of my sources, you know, called me at two hours after it published to say he'd gotten jumped, he broke his rib, you know, for nothing more than just being looking at looking at somebody the wrong way, you know. So it's really it's 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 a it's a nonviolent community generally, you know, and and um, I've seen people get decked for nothing. Thanks for that site, Chris. Um, COVID-19 testing has been scarce across the U.S. well below what is needed to have an accurate understanding of new cases. Is uh, testing available in Kensington or, or other nearby neighborhoods? And I pose this um, question to, to, to Carol and Ben, and, and um, Carol nicely came up with a, a whole list of, of testing options uh, in Kensington as well as some other places around Philadelphia. Um, so I guess we can just put that list up there and just, Carol, do you have any just comments um, just about testing in general that you might have observed? No, the only thing is I wanna add that I, um, I did get news that Philly Fight is gonna start a community testing site and outdoor medical clinic at Visitation, which is at Kensington and Lehigh. I don't know when. Okay, that's just something I wanted to add. Thank you. You're welcome. Ben, did you have some um, thoughts on testing? Yeah, so there are, uh, as Carol suggests, there are eight city testing sites plus 10 hospital-based testing sites. There are additional four health centers that are conducting testing as well as one Rite Aid. Um, the Rock Ministries has partnered with Esperanza Health Center to offer testing uh, Monday to Friday, I think at, at Kensington and Lehigh uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. I don't know when they're starting, though. Um, I think that there are some qualifications there, of course, you know, they have about a seven day turnaround time um, for results. 
which makes the, the resulting process somewhat difficult, specifically for those with phones. I know that they've implemented a, a contingency, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, a friend who has a phone number and, and doing a, a sort of chain-based uh, results reporting for them. Um, it seems like a lot of these testing centers have also adopted one specific test, the, the Abbott Pharmaceuticals ID Now test. Um, I, there, there was an interesting report coming out on, uh, uh, on NPR the other week suggesting that this uh, specific test modality has a false negative rate of around 14.8%. Uh, I know that the city is working on creating a, a validation study, but you know, this problem has serious implications uh, as we bring contact tracing online and, att and attempt to implement containment measures. So yes, uh, you know, testing is available. It's increasingly available. The tests that we're using and the, the demand for testing uh, still leave a, a great deal to be desired. If I can jump in real quick, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to test, but what do we do then? You know, quarantining a population that, that needs daily, um, a daily means of, of getting well. Um, you, you know, I've heard stories of people leaving, you know, just, just walking out because you, you, you can't leave. You know? So I, I would like to give props, to, you know, a rare props to the DEA that, that recently announced they'd, ex they'd expand uh, methadone dosing offsite in mobile units. Um, if we could arrange things like that, I think it'd be a good opportunity um, to, you know, to, um, to introduce people to treatment um, in, a con in, a, in a controlled environment. But um, I can't think of too many people that would stay in quarantine and get, unless it was against their will uh, through withdrawal. That's a good point. And just moving on from, from testing to cases, the latest city data indicates about 314 total cases in the Kensington zip code 19134, which is a pretty small fraction of the overall 11,000 cases in in Philadelphia. So I'm just wondering if there's been any reported cases of COVID-19 among people who use drugs in, in Kensington, among outreach workers or, or deaths. Um, Clayton, do you have any, um, any insight into that question? Um, so I haven't heard of any specific deaths from the people that we're working with specifically. Um, it's very possible as we've seen a lot of folks um, find new places to, you know, maybe distance. I mean, if not in a home, maybe in a certain neighborhood. Um, we continue to do the best we can to provide our essential services to folks, but there's no guarantee that um, folks are going to be able to reach uh, the same places that we typically operate in, given transportation concerns, financial concerns, as Chris mentioned. Um, you know, as a staff, uh, we have definitely had to like have folks, you know, do self quarantining as folks are uh, under consistent high risk uh, opportunities. Um, so I can certainly imagine, um, and this is the problem with a lack of testing or testing only if you show symptoms. It's hard to you know tell whether folks are asymptomatic and not showing you know the symptoms that would necessitate getting tested by the strict restrictions that a lot of these testing sites have um or they are just going through a common you know cold flu uh, allergy um cycle um so it's a real challenge um while there has been expansion of testing opportunities it's still very much a real hard challenge to uh you know get answers and until we find not only more testing sites that are uh, l less with less restrictions um, and testing you know from a various amount of places and rapid testing honestly um, we're gonna have a whole bunch of question marks in any you know neighborhood um, in the city um, any category of, of people um, you know who could possibly be uh, affected, which is obviously everyone right now. Carol, how about you? Have you been made aware of any particular uh, individuals who've contracted COVID-19, either outreach workers or uh, people you I know one outreach worker, and thankfully, as of last night, the person was still doing well. Um, tired, you know, nervous, and quarantine is very hard for a person, but 
they're doing okay. Um, I do know of a few individuals that we see on the streets who have the virus. Um, they're all still in contact with me, all three of them, so they're still okay too. Um, no deaths so far, thank, thank God. That's all I can say. Let's kind of move on to some more specific um, impacts on uh, maybe some of the drug use behaviors, practices, risks. Uh, Philadelphia, as I mentioned earlier, has one of the highest overdose rates in the country with over 1,100 deaths in 2019. Um, what's been the impact on COVID-19 on overdose uh, emergency and deaths? Um, Clayton, have you noticed any kind of impact at, at Prevention Point? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, honestly, we aren't, we're giving out as much um, Narcan, naloxone, hydrochloride, as we have been, in fact, we're giving out more um, Narcan and we are, you know, trying to expand it to doing it at, you know, different, different sites and different levels. Um, that being said, um, data tells you one thing. Data tells you that overdoses aren't, you know, tremendously higher than they have been in the summertime spike uh, in previous years. Um, but there's been some, you know, anecdotal data um, from folks who are, you know, working in other agencies or other areas uh, of the city that uh, overdoses are, you know, a little bit higher than they normally are. Um, so it, it's really hard to tell. I mean, I can say as someone that lays eyes on our area, I'm not seeing a tremendous increase, but when folks are spread out in different pockets in part to probably either group social distance or individual social distance. Um, and the notion that we've always used, especially around using is don't use by yourself, there is a chance that there's gonna be an increase, but the data says one thing. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, there's anecdotal data that comes from different organizations and, you know, people working with people that tells you something different. So it's like possibly, and then maybe not. It's, it's a real mixed bag right now. If I can jump in there for a moment from, from sources that I have that are privy to the daily morning report from Prevention Point, the uh, EMTs and police, um, we have days with no fatals, which is pretty, like that was pretty unheard of a year ago, you know. Um, I've talked to some uh, analysts near the Mexican border that think it may, may just be a, a perception um, on the end of local suppliers that there's going to be a, a you know a, a drought you know as as they, as they get tighter at the border. And he says there's still plenty of um, product moving across the border. Uh, that what could be problematic, however, is is substitutions. You know, uh, putting more xylazine or tran tranquilizer because. Um, people will buy anything when they need to. So if, if there's a perception that there's a, a, a supply issue, um, you know, uh, the, the chemists, the millers, the people that are putting together the, the, the bags of work are, are gonna try to get more creative um, in, in keeping people um, come back, you know? Um, and, and they're already feeling the pressure. I mean, I heard, heard anecdotally that of, a, of a man that was that was punched uh, and you know, you know, kind of beaten up a little bit uh, just for not going to a particular set and go into another one because they had better dope. So, you know, you're, you're going to see conflicts like that. Um, I guess I just would stress that when you put it a, a powder, it's like you know, a, a community that's been already been stressed by by the diaspora um, and the increase in the transient population and the fentanyl. Throw something else on top. And um, it's, it's t yeah, it's tough up there now. Yeah. I would also add um, just quickly that, you know, this, this virus, uh, you know, coronavirus, COVID-19 that we're dealing with impacts collection of data uh, heavily as well. So, you know, this is where there's question marks about what's really going on because, you know, social distancing and contact being as best as possible brief uh, in most cases uh, says that some of the steps that you would take to collect the data that would give you some of the answers um, has to be you know, shorter in nature, which means in most cases, less detail oriented. Um, so you know, it's really hard to tell, which is why I think, uh, as I mentioned before, 
um, when you can have more, uh, you know, testing available and you have shorter wait times between testing and folks know that, you know, the curve is down and interactions uh, can be more, you know, robust um, because, you know, they know that there are solutions that can be had. Um, I think that, you know, we'll get more true data, um, you know, whether that's from a qualitative and or a quantitative side of things. Good. Um, just moving on, reversing a drug overdose is very much a hands-on technique involves close interaction with the overdose victim, such as mouth-to-mouth -mouth recitation and administering naloxone via the nasal passages. Have there been any changes to how overdose reversals are being approached by outreach workers or medical professionals, including rescue breathing or naloxone administration? Ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so you, by and large, overdose reversals have continued much as they always have. Um, we continue to distribute Narcan, more Narcan now than ever actually, uh, not just through Prevention Point, but also uh, the Pennsylvania Harm Reduction Coalition has implemented a, um, um, they, they've implemented a mail order naloxone program. Um, the, the big differences come in terms of the number of people that we have responding to overdoses. Uh, rather than having a, a large team of folks run out, we limit the number of people. Um, on top of that, um, we make sure that, you know, bystanders are standing well away from the overdose site because, you know, certainly uh, performing rescue breathing, a lot of these uh, things can be uh, respiratory droplet generating procedures. Uh, and I guess that's really where we come to the biggest tricky issue here is that rescue breathing within the community when you don't have a bag valve mask is a very high risk activity in terms of transmitting COVID-19 from rescuer to rescuee or vice versa. And while tools such as the bag valve mask and face shields can reduce that risk, it can't be brought down to zero. Um, and breathing is important. Without timely reversal, you know, opiate overdose will cause respiratory depression that may deteriorate into apnea, leading to anoxic brain injury. And you know, there are a number of models suggesting that for every minute that the brain doesn't get blood, that doesn't get oxygenated blood, you lose millions of neurons, billions of synapses, and, and miles, miles of myelinated fibers in the brain. Uh, so in the minutes that are immediately following an opioid overdose, especially one where the respiratory rate drops to zero, time is brain. And in that setting, we've seen a, a number of folks demonstrating some real heroism, making the informed choice to deliver rescue breaths to those who can't breathe for themselves, despite the risk. Uh, because when you find yourself in a, in a life and death situation, that's the choice that some people do tend to make. Let's move on to um, syringe, uh, the kind of syringe distribution disposal. So Prevention Point's one of the largest distributors and collectors of syringes to people who inject drugs in the country. Thousands of syringes are distributed and collected each week. How have the efforts to distribute syringes and harm reduction equipment been impacted? Um, Carol, do you want to Give us some thoughts on that. Uh, we're aimed as a mobile syringe exchange and we're across the city now. We are seeing more participants than ever. Um, it's been a jump since it started, right? They're not only coming for clean supplies, they're coming for Narcan, personal health protection, masks, gloves, sanitizer, food, water, and support, right? Like, they, not everybody's out there like they used to be. They're they're doing a lot of their meetings online. There's no one-on-one. -on -one. I forgotten how much a hug really does mean and not just to our participants, but to us too. I see one of my people in the park use him for the first time in over a year and a half. And he looked at me and wanted to cry and I looked at him and wanted to hug him. And that was so hard. It, it was, it was extremely hard. Like we're in contact, we're call, talking and everything and he's doing better now. But through all this, you see that, you know, that personal touch means a lot. Even if it is just coming to the bus and being able to sit and talk with us one-on-one, -on -one, even though we can't hug now, you know, we do the virtual hugs, you know, but we're, we're seeing a big jump in participants on the exchange. How about at a prevention point, Clayton? How's that, the COVID-19 impacting the syringe distribution and collection? Um, we are giving out more syringes than we have 
Um, we are collecting the same amount, which is around 80, 85 to 90% of those syringes back. Um, the interactions are shorter. Um, we are going down to doing less days of syringe access, but giving more syringes out um, on the days that we are available. Um, so we basically are going from a five day access model um, to, uh, well, five day access with three of them uh, being what we call emergency packs, which is syringes and supplies for those who don't have anything. Um, and then two full exchange days to, um, you know, two exchange days and one um, what we call emergency pack day, but ramping up the amount that we give out so folks don't have to, you know, think about reusing or sharing um, their supplies, um, including their syringes. Um, I mean, we're doing this in part around distancing, around shortening the interactions. Um, and, you know, the numbers look good. I will say that the mobile sites seem to have a slight decrease uh, in them. Um, but I can also say when transportation is a concern um, and, you know, public transportation going to a weekend schedule, um, you know, is certainly a concern for a lot of our folks. Um, I believe that is a, a major, you know, concern or a reason why that's happened. But as far as our, you know, Kensington Avenue, uh, you know, in building um, exchanges uh, and access points, uh, we're still doing, doing the same amount of numbers. We're bringing back the same amount. Um, we're giving out more Narcan. Um, everything's been, you know, full tilt and our mobile sites are um, save one location, 63rd and Market, um, during the same times, the same locations on a weekly basis. So um, we're trying to be as consistent as possible. Um, and, you know, th that we're going to continue to do that as best as we can. Very good. So I'm going to try to just get one or two more of our questions in before we go to the uh, participant questions. And one of them has to do with um, the price, purity, and availability. And Chris, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but Philadelphia, particularly, Places like Kensington are known for relatively pure and inexpensive opioids that are available from the street sellers. What's been the impact on price, purity, and availability of heroin and fentanyl? You're on, you're on mute. Sorry, Chris, you're on mute. There we go. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I'll start by uh, discussing a project we ran briefly um, with the, the gracious help of a lab that um, will remain un, unnamed here. Uh, but we were testing in relatively real time samples of street heroin um, through most of the uh, part of the summer and fall. Um, and well, the first thing I would say is that um, heroin and fentanyl are pretty much together in, in every bag you'll get out there. But we've seen a real uh, jump in xylazine, the tranquilizer. Um, it's in everything. Sometimes uh, it's the dominant drug. Um, as far as price goes, so so we're still getting heroin from the traditional supply routes, um, and that would that's Mexico. I mean, when I hear from you know geo, geopolitical analysts about there's some conflict between Colombia and Mexico, and that you know there's some larger things that could roll into play here. But the, per the perception that we would have a supply problem would largely be um, uh, just that, a, per a perception, I believe. Um, I have seen bags sell for $3, which is, um, you know, a first. Um, th that's like, you know, in the 1970s, I think, were tray, ba tray bags. But um, it it's like few and far between. Um, people didn't seem to catch up. Um, you can get two for fives occasionally um so it's uh yeah i mean prices you, you have a infinite number of people trying to sell you know and and uh and and uh, the, the demand is not backed by the money that it used to be i mean i guess the one thing that has helped was you know the the announcement by the city that they wouldn't take in nonviolent offenders so there's a lot of boosting i mean you can't ride the train without being you know trying to have someone trying to sell you something but you know there's only so far so long that that's just going to be sustainable a lot a lot of people did work i mean there's you know we we deal with i like to tell people you know don't judge drug users by 
the people that I work around. Like that is not, that is just a very specific group, you know, of drug users. And, and it's a lot harder to tap into the people that have had, that have jobs that, that have responsibilities that have family that we don't see on the streets that aren't part of the transient population and how they're faring through this. Um, so it's just something we want to keep in mind. Thanks. Just one, one last question I want to get to before we get to the uh, audience questions. And it's around um, drug treatment. I thought, Ben, you could just maybe give a quick, some quick insights into how the demand for drug treatment is impacted and how the impact it's been on buprenorphine um, and methadone administration. Certainly. So um, I, I think, you know, I, I can't really speak to demand yet. We don't have the, the evidence to say what direction the demand is going in right now. But what I can say is that as our small, you know, program at, at Prevention Point, prior to the epidemic, we were serving 180 some clients and now we're serving over 200. Um, the DEA has relaxed some of its guidelines around telemedicine prescribing, specifically of buprenorphine, but also on the horizon, some changes to methadone uh, prescribing. And um, that relaxation has allowed us to implement a telephone only uh, buprenorphine service at Prevention Point. Um, we piloted this initially with um, uh, uh, partners from uh, Project SAFE, the Soul Collective, and uh, now uh, with some warm handoffs from the Philadelphia Correctional Institutions. Um, and I gotta say, it's going very well. Um, we've increased, I believe, the number of folks who are coming back for, second, uh, for their second visits. We um, have eliminated drug testing, which you know, always felt to me to be a very sort of punitive um, uh, police-like action for a, a health center to be engaging in. Um, so I, I think those are some very positive changes. Um, there are some negative changes. Many inpatient facilities have suspended new intakes. There are a few that are still open. Um, for outpatient facilities, many, uh, both IOPs and recovery support groups have started meeting virtually. Um, there are a number of free online recovery support groups um, that uh, are really just doing some very innovative work in that field. Um, with regard to methadone, the FDA is working to relax its guidelines. I know that New York just implemented a mobile methadone delivery service uh, somewhat ahead of the federals. So uh, I'm really impressed by that and I, I look forward to a future where um, these changes, these relaxations in the regulatory structure are made permanent. Excellent. So we're gonna move on to um, some of the questions posed by the, by the audience. And so I'm just kind of scrolling through here. Um, so one question is, does any of the new stimulus money come to harm reduction programs? So has, has anyone seen any of that money or um, heard about any of that in places like Prevention Point or Community Groups? Um, well, I, I would say, as far as I understand it, it goes to individuals. We did just get a big um, uh, the lump of money from, I think, the, the Bloomberg organization. I don't know how that's been dispersed. Um, I don't think there's any stimulus money um, specifically earmarked for harm reduction, but individuals will receive it. I mean, not necessarily through stimulus money, but certainly there's been emergency funding around COVID-19 that we were or have been able to apply for and get. And then there's obviously businesses or business, um, you know, exceptions um, that can be used for small, you know, for nonprofits, relatively small nonprofits, um, you know, that can be accessed as well, um, you know it's waiting on federal funding or waiting on state funding, which is the hardest, uh, you know, thing to do. Um, and, you know, honestly, a lack of, um, a lack of, you know, plan um, starting from, you know, federal um, down has certainly hurt this whole process as far as um, basically every, you know, aspect that we've talked about during this whole phone call. Um, so, you know, anything that is related to helping the folks that we want to work with and work for 
um, has been impacted. Um, there is funding, but the question is how long does the funding, you know, take to get to you? How much is the funding? Um, and what can actually happen outside of the funding that could have helped, but in all likelihood should have been helping before we had a pandemic, um, you know, on our plates. Another question from the audience is, what provisions are being made for um, sex workers? Anyone aware of any particular programs or outreach for people who are engaging in sex work? I don't know of anything that is new. I know that a lot of the services have been cut back, right? Because of the virus, so they've closed. I don't know anything new for people. Yeah, I think it's important to, to think about how folks who are engaged in that specific sector of the economy are oftentimes excluded from things like unemployment benefits. And that, that really only makes more acute the, the problems that that community is facing. So it's, you know, my, my heart goes out to all the folks engaged in sex work right now because um, they're really getting the short end of the stick. A bunch of the other questions that I'm reading through seem to be similar to ones that we've already posed. Um, I had a question back regarding um, medical cannabis. So medical cannabis has been legal in Pennsylvania since 2016. It um, can be used as a substitute for opioids. It can be a uh, qualifying condition is for anxiety. Any sense of whether medical cannabis is being more readily um, kind of prescribed or made available during this crisis. Ben, you might have some thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, certainly. So, um, you know, I, I'm one of the few uh, physicians in the city, I think there are a couple hundred of us maybe, uh, who do these medical evaluations to certify patients to visit the dispensary. Of course, this is not a prescription because if we were prescribing a controlled substance without the DEA's say so, we'd be all let away in handcuffs. Um, that said, um, the DEA has relaxed, I'm sorry, the, the state of Pennsylvania has relaxed its requirements on these certification exams. They used to uh, be required to be in person. Now they can be done over the telephone. So I've been doing a couple of uh, telephone certifications. Um, I've been advising patients against burning any kind of plant material and putting it into their lungs. Um, it, it disrupts the lungs mucociliary escalator and prevents uh, clearance of, of uh, uh, things out of the lungs. Um, that said, you know, I think that uh, my patients, I, I've been advising them to use tinctures, edibles, um, you know, uh, tablets that contain cannabinoids uh, in place of burning plant material and putting it into their lungs. How about the impact of um, this crisis on um, crime and, and policing? Chris, you alluded to this a little bit about just being on the subway and there's a lot more selling going on. Have you noticed less police, more police, or how have police been kind of interacting with, with folks on yeah. the streets? I think in the early days of the first couple of weeks, there was an attempt to, to scatter people a bit. Um, I, I, I haven't, the police presence is really not, very like doesn't appear to be very hot right now um police don't really want to interact with people um you know and, and for the most part at least when we talk about police on gathering we're probably not the same i just had a, a long sit down to do with uh east town metro and um you know he's concerned about the population up there he doesn't see any he doesn't see any need to go uh you know you know arrest or harass somebody who's injecting um, because if you know, it's just, they're, they're not going to get prosecuted. I mean, they're, they're really, the best they can do is just keep the peace. I think at this point, um, I don't know about you know large investigations. The DEA has shifted to doctors um, more more so, and, and the, the Attorney General of Pennsylvania is doing a lot of the citywide heroin and drug cases. But um, you know, I, I do know someone that's that got picked up for, you know, just possession um, just before COVID hit and been sitting in there ever since. So 
um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not gone away, but I think police are wary about the physical contact it'll, it'll require. Um, I mean, and that's probably a good thing. Um, I, people with warrants aren't, aren't necessarily getting checked as random, you know, as randomly and as infrequently as they were. Carol, have you had any observations based on you're out kind of on a pretty daily basis? Any observations you have about police presence or interaction? It's been quite odd. Like today when I was down there, there was a cop car just sitting, walking in the street with two cops leaning on it, laughing at everybody. Like, I, what was that about, right? And I couldn't stop because I was on my way somewhere, but I wanted to stop and ask my guys, like, what, what is this about? Like, they're just sitting there laughing. Like, I, I don't know. It, it seems different to me, right? I, I don't know. Um, the SEPTA cops, I have to say, have seemed a little more encouraging. I actually yelled at one because he didn't have a mask on when he was talking with my people. And he was very close. And I was like, yo, put your mask on. I know you have one. You're too close to my people. They're laughing because they're like, look at you yelling at them for talking to us without a mask, but you're not yelling at us. I mean, do you have a mask? And they're like, no, I said, that's why I'm not yelling at you. But, you know, it, and he was all right. He kind of chuckled and said, you're right. And put the mask on, you know, but I, I don't know. It just seems a little odd to me right now. I can't put my finger on it. Yeah, there's just for some, I know that the, the police, the, the personal protective equipment is not so readily available to, for them either. So, so I think there's a bit of probably reticence all the way around in terms of public interaction engagement. Um, we're almost we're almost out of time and this might be, um, I wanted to ask some questions about um, a bunch of other questions, but maybe just one last question about just the public use of drugs. Um, so that's kind of a reason for the, the, emph the emphasis to open an overdose prevention site. Um, just given the, the problems around social distancing and, and homelessness, has there been any kind of change in what you, is being observed on the streets in terms of public injection or just congregation, how people are using drugs on the streets? Chris, do you have any right. that? I have some photos here with you. Yeah, um, just taken this week. Um, yeah, I mean, it, people are still clustered. I mean, it, it, uh, my concern is for the, um, the people that use substances like crack cocaine or methamphetamine and smoke it because you're passing around a pipe. I heard, you know, just yesterday a guy asking around, yo, anybody got, anybody got a straight in the lighter? Anybody got a straight in the lighter? And he found somebody that did. And this is a straight that had just been probably in somebody else's mouth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a function of, you know, in my opinion, the closure of El Campamento, um, and it's been just getting worse ever since. How about you, Carol? Have you had any kind of insights? I'm sorry, you're cutting out. I don't know if you disrupted my connection. Okay. Anyway, you know, yeah, go ahead, Carol. No, go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just gonna say I I don't know if I, I call came in I don't know if it disrupted my connection but um uh yeah I mean it, it, I I haven't seen I mean I will say there's it, it seems like it's just surreal up there I mean it's I'd say there's fewer people in like in total um but the people that are there are are you know an ever present uh you know uh, uh, are ever present that they're congregating they they close Somerset. There was a lot, uh, a lot of concern that that was going to push everybody up to Allegheny, but there is absolutely a camp, a camp still around the Somerset Station. So, um, you know, it's uh, pu public usage is 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 just as, as you know as evident as it ever was. Just quickly, Carol, do you have any further um, comments or insights into that? Just the public use. <laughs> I'm seeing the same. I haven't seen less people um, using. I've seen people using right out in the open like they were. Um, what we are seeing is people asking for more supplies, asking for gloves, asking for stems. They they don't want to share, right? But they will if it comes down to it. Any final words from uh, Clayton or Ben on that topic? Or any, anything else just before we wrap up? I would say only this, which is that social distancing is an important thing to stop the spread of COVID-19. It, its ends 
are not coterminous with the idea of using in groups, which is the safest way to do it if you're going to do it. And one way to address that problem of maintaining social distance while at the same time providing supervision for, for folks who are concerned that the drugs they might have are, are you know, contain some adulterant that could threaten their life would be to open a supervised consumption space. I think now more than ever, that's an important intervention and it shouldn't get lost in the fray. And let me also add um, that uh, harm reduction in COVID-19 um, means, you know, doing things that might sound counterintuitive to some. So, you know, the expectation that folks can social distance um, even before possibly being, um, you know, infected with COVID-19 um, is uh, in some cases ridiculous to even think. So it's like thinking out of the box around like, you know, if you're going to be with a group of people, make sure that this is the group of people that you're going to be with consistently um, instead of, you know, being with multiple groups um, and, and, you know, using or, you know, being around with the potential to spread disease between all five groups. That is the out of the box thinking that, um, you know, needs to be in the box when it comes to harm reduction and COVID-19 um, for the reasons that were spoken of um, as far as overdose prevention um, and saving lives. So, uh, you know, COVID-19 definitely challenges um, the harm reduction community, the public health community, all communities that are working with folks to be realistic about, you know, what we always speak about compared to what, um, are major factors with the pandemic we're dealing with right now. That's a great uh, final point. So I think we're gonna have to, to wrap it up there. I really wanna thank um, Ben, Clayton, Carol, Chris for your, for your insights and time today um, and all the great work you've been doing out and about to kind of address this. Just add to what Ben said. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean ultimately, uh, which, uh, you know, overdose prevention sites are, are needed, um, but, but what we really need to, I'm going to say something even more radical, and that's we need safe supply. I mean, we need to start modeling Canada uh, and, and places like Toronto where they're distributing um, hydromorphone um, so we can, you know, people can use safely alone at home. Um, you know, because uh, opioids don't have to lead, overdose is not a necessary result of overdose use or of opioid use, you know. Um, so I just, you know, I, I would say that that's a step in the right direction, but um, the supply is just going to get more cut down or more dangerous as this proceeds. Uh, yes. Thank you, Steve, for having me. And absolutely, safe supply is a priority. And the sooner the better we have that, the sooner the uh, overdose epidemic or the fatal overdose epidemic uh, will end. Thanks again for everyone's. Um, taking the time and all the audience members for, for listening. Hopefully it was informative and um, keep staying tuned to the Drexel website for future uh, webinars on the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks for having me. Thanks everybody.